Good morning. morning. It is good for us to be gathered to worship together this morning here in person and online. A few announcements here at the beginning. You'll note that in the announcements that are in here, um, there's a number of them, including a few inserts. First off, if you would like us to remember somebody on All Saints Sunday, which is Sunday, November 3rd, please fill this out and we will include them in our list of those that we are praying for. We do need these back by the Sunday before October 27th so that we can get them included. Also, it is fun to hear that the Holy Family Warming Shelter had been doing some updates over the summer and they'll be having a grand unveiling of these renovations on October 24th. If you're looking for ways to help with the hurricane recovery, um, both of Helene and Milton now, um, on the back of that insert, there is a QR code and a way to um, designate towards Lutheran disaster response. Um, I've already been seeing posts about ways that Lutheran disaster response, uh, I believe there's a Lutheran disaster response Carolina Um, And there's some pastors there who have been posting in our ELCA clergy page about the ways um, they're working with those, especially towards Asheville, to get them the things that they are most desperately needing. And so this money is a way to help provide those things they need. Um, A few other things. Note that we are getting very close to the start of our centennial year. With that, there's a few announcements. The absolute deadline for your recipes is this Tuesday the 15th. They have to be in by Tuesday for them to be part of our cookbook, because it won't be long after that we put the final touches and send it to the printer. And then also, if you are looking to be part of the new photo directory task force, please sign up. Uh, That task force will start here soon. And I know that our task force looking at our prayer garden has been meeting a number of times and have some fun things that they're looking at. And then we start officially for our centennial celebration on Reformation Sunday, October 27th, where the former called Pastor Pastor Matt Agee will be here to preach that Sunday. I know the congregation is excited to see one of their former pastors back for that. And you can see all of these other things. I also want to make a note that I know that those who take part in the caring and sharing with Riverside are excited that they have just moved where their closet is located. It had been up some stairs at the school. It has now moved down to the main level. Tomorrow they'll do their finishing touches, and this Thursday will be the first time families It will be open to families in this new location. It is something we have been looking forward to, to have that new location in the school. With that, I invite you to stand as you are able as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Let us confess our sin and to come to God for healing. Let us take a moment now to think about those things that separate us from God. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have honored you with our lips, but have harmed our neighbors with our tongues. The cravings at war within us 
cause conflicts and disputes. In our desire to be first, we make distinctions among ourselves. The needs of the poor and the suffering at last. In your great mercy, forgive us our sins. Draw near to us with grace in time of need and turn us to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God promises to forgive our iniquity and to remember our sin no more. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of eternal healing, your sins are forgiven. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. all Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. You may be seated. The first reading is from Amos chapter 5. A reading from Amos. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. <clears throat> Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 4. A reading from Hebrews. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden but all are naked and lay bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. Will you please pray with me? Oh God, may the words spoken and the words heard be your words. For only when you speak do we have life. Amen. Amen. So today we get this seven of twelve readings for Mark as we continue on the journey. And we start out by hearing that Jesus was setting out on a journey, but really the better translation was that he was setting out on the way. With that wording, we hear the connection back to the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, where we hear of John out in the wilderness calling out, prepare the way of the Lord. And it also makes the connections to those early and first hearers of this gospel who are not known as Christians, but those who are, on, who are part of the way. So Jesus was about to head out on the way. 
And we know that that way is towards Jerusalem and Golgotha. And it just happens that this man runs up to him, kneels before Jesus, and asks a sincere question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with, well, first, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. Second, Jesus starts listing the commandments. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness or defraud, honor father and mother. Which if we pay attention, and we'll come back to this later, if we pay attention, the commandments Jesus lists here, are the second half ones, the ones dealing with relationship with our neighbors, with other people. And the man says, oh, I've kept them all since I, you. And Jesus is like, well, you lack one thing. Give everything you own away. Give the proceeds to the poor. Come and follow me. To which the man went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then we see that the scene expands, adding in the disciples who are on the periphery watching this all go down. We get that famous quote that we hear of, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples asking the question that probably all have then who, who can be saved? And we get, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Then we have Peter going like, wait, wait, wait. We, your disciples, have already done this. We've left our nets and our boats and our families and everything behind to follow you. If we are truly honest with ourselves, this is a tough text to hear. What do we do with this? How does a preacher preach this? Because this is not a text that is comfortable or palatable to most people. And preachers in the past have their standard time-honored strategies of trying to manage this text. Well, the rich young man didn't actually keep all those commandments. So, you know, the thing about giving up his possessions, that's just a way of calling his bluff. And we can expand that as, mm, Nobody can keep all the commandments all the time. So really, this is just a rhetorical device to calling our bluff. We're all good. We're off the hook. Some have said that, oh, giving up everything was a command to this one specific person and only to him. This doesn't apply to me. Or if we saw it as a command to a bigger command, well, it only applies to the rich. And there's somebody richer than me, so it can't apply to me. Or the disciples on the other side, well, everyone's rich. Presumably because even the poor can think of someone who is poorer than them. And Jesus gives us this divine out. We can't do it, but God can, so we don't even need to try. We've tried to do gymnastics around this text to make it be comfortable, and it doesn't apply to me. But I'm going to say for today, 
Let's live into that uncomfortableness, the unpalatableness of this text, so that we're not looking at it, trying to find a way to maneuver and make it not about me. But let us look at this instead as a framework and a place to wrestle with what does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Let's first look at that question the man poses. Could a teacher, what, does it, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And this question is packed with insights about this man's beliefs. First, that he presupposes that eternal life is inherited and that it is inherited by those who have done certain things, particularly good and righteous actions. Which leads us to our second presupposition, that there is a right way, a right action in order to inherit, that there is something I can do to inherit eternal life. But in Jesus' response, he outright rejects both of these presuppositions that salvation isn't earned and there isn't anything any one of us can do on our own to achieve eternal life. And at this point, Jesus says to this man, mm, there is one thing that you lack. But in this comes our bigger question. What is that one thing that he's missing? I need to know so I don't miss that same thing. But in Jesus' response, there is no real answer to what that one thing is. We hear... Jesus, tell him, go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor. Come, follow me. But that could lead us with multiple ways of understanding what that one thing is. Could it be that the man does not trust and rely on God? That he relies on himself, on his resources, materials, on these multitude of possessions, that that is what he trusts. I mean, we could connect this then to which commandments Jesus asks him about. And he says, yep, I've kept all of those later commandments dealing with my relationship with my neighbor." But there's no mention of those first four commandments of my relationship with God. Also, it could be in the fact that Jesus specifically chooses for this man that he must relinquish his wealth and his belongings. All these things of self-sufficiency. We could also see that this one thing that this man is missing could be the fact that he has these many possessions. That there's an ethical standing to be gained from selling and giving the proceeds to the poor. That the one thing is that this man is missing generosity. But we do have to note that at this point, Jesus doesn't tell everyone around him to do the same. So where does that leave us? What is that one thing? Or what if it's both of those things? Because if we look deeper, we see a connection. 
that in both of them, it leads us back to self-centeredness, of placing the self at the center of it all. And as I start to think about that, I jump back to middle school and high school of learning maybe in science class, maybe in history class, maybe in both of them, learning about the universe and the solar system and how human understanding and knowledge over the years, the decades, the centuries, the millennia, our understanding has changed. Particularly thinking about the center of the universe, the center of our solar system. There was a long time that it was believed that everything, the whole universe, revolved around the earth. That the whole universe revolved around us. And this earth-centric or geocentric model and I remember learning in multiple places about Copernicus in the 1500s and his mathematical model that it actually should be a heliocentric model. That the universe and the solar system revolves around the sun. Which it's to note, it was proposed way earlier than the Copernicus in the 1500s, but it never gained traction. But with Copernicus, it started to gain some traction because he did it in a way to make sure he didn't offend the Pope and the Vatican. This is possibly a way we could understand the universe. But this change was at the heart of so much of belief. There was controversy. Religious leaders like Martin Luther himself, who was a contemporary of Copernicus, it's interesting to make those connections of who's contemporaries of each other. And Melanchthon, another early Lutheran theologian, John Calvin, all opposed Copernicus's view of this heliocentric model. It was controversial. It took time to make this change about what is the center of our solar system. To move from Earth-centered and move it away to Sun-centered. It's hard to make that change of what is the, at the center of our beliefs. Which leads me to thinking maybe I'm starting to follow in all of those gymnastics that other preachers have done throughout the years and asking this question. What if Jesus isn't prescribing a one-size-fits-all answer to what that one thing is that we lack? What if it's not one size fits all, but that he purposely leaves this open-ended so that each one of us has to question for ourselves? Where is our center? What is the one thing we lack? We could say it as what is blocking or what barriers keep us from right relationship with God and with neighbor? What in our lives inhibits the work of the kingdom of God? If we start to think about that, maybe we start to realize that we are like the man in the story whether we want to admit it or not that at the center of our lives and our trust is money and wealth, 
Maybe it's our self-reliance on what I can do and I can achieve. I bring about my own salvation. Maybe we lack trust in God. And that we trust ourselves more. Maybe for some it's that we place power and specifically power over at the center. Maybe it's judgment. They're not like me. They must be wrong, and I am right. With this text, we have to stay uncomfortable. Because as we see at the center of our lives, what we put our trust in is being pushed up against and questioned. We are hearing that we must change from me, myself, and I at the center of my life, the center of my own salvation. And to change what's at the center. To what does it mean to be a disciple and a follower of God? It's hard to change and hard to acknowledge those pieces and those barriers that keep us from the work of the kingdom. And as we ask these questions, we have to make sure that we don't try to rationalize away the economic implications. They are still there. We can't maneuver our way out. But in the midst of this, as we are trying to realize we have to change our center, the good news we hear in this gospel text comes from Jesus' response. Then who can be saved? We cannot save ourselves. Nothing we can do to inherit eternal life. We hear the good news that salvation is a gift from God. It is something not to be obtained. It is something that we can only receive. And in that gift, we are called to step forward, or we could say to reorient or recenter ourselves and our lives to what promotes the work of the kingdom. To center love, justice, and yes, even economic generosity. And as it takes time for us to adjust to this new model of what is at the center of our lives, we hear that Jesus looks at us and loves us. Amen.
invite you to stay standing and invite forward those, well, I guess we'll get there in just a minute. Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for these people, one with us in the body of Christ, whom we welcome as new members into the life and ministry of this congregation. We welcome new members today. I invite forward those who are here at the service to come forward at this time. morning, Joy and Kristen, and Kristen's representing her children as well, <laughs> and husband. Um, as we... So with the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We are called to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Siblings in Christ, Joy and Kristen, do you intend to continue in the covenant of your baptism among God's people in this place? If so, say, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. People of God gathered, do you promise to support and pray for these new members in their life in Christ? If so, say, we do, and we ask God to help and guide us. We do, and we ask God to help and guide us. At this time, I invite you to turn towards, it's really quickly. Let us welcome these siblings in Christ to this community of faith. We rejoice with you in the life of baptism. Together, we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. We make Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Compassionate God, embolden the church to seek all who are lost, clothe those who are naked, and mend what is broken. May we be generous bearers of your eternal love. God of grace. Amen. Sustaining God, as we approach harvest time, we pray for farmers, field workers, and those who process crops. Keep us mindful of environmental threats to the nourishing food that feeds the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Steadfast God, inspire world leaders to share resources and work collectively to end global poverty starvation, and preventable disease. Direct us to seek justice and equity, that all may live in peace. God of grace, yeah. hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who are afflicted, tormented, grieving, oppressed, and lonely. We especially pray for healing and comfort for those on the prayer list.
the Palestinian people. Deliver the strength of your love and compassion to all who need it today. God of grace, hear our prayer. Generous God, we give thanks for the first nations and tribes who inhabited this land. We lament the harm done by colonization. Call us to deeper appreciation and care for the languages, rituals, and history of all indigenous people. God of grace, hear our prayer. Ever-living God, we rejoice to be heirs of the eternal life made real in Jesus' death and resurrection. We give thanks for saints of all times and places, first and last, who still inspire us to faithful living. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of peace with one another. Show 
Blessed are you, O God, source of every gift of your creation. By these gifts and with our lives, help us to serve one another and all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels of the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. At this time, you may be seated. And coming forward for communion, you'll create two lines down the center. Me and the assisting minister will have bread. There is gluten-free available as well. Please let us know. The communion assistants have wine on the outside and white grape juice in the center ring of the tree. Know that this table doesn't belong to me. This table does not belong to this congregation. This table belongs to God. And it is an ever-expanding table where you can come and find a place. So come. Jesus welcomes you to the table. Come. Here is your God.
I invite you to stand as you are able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace unto everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist us in this ministry on which we are sent forth. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this sacrament, that through the body and blood of your Son, we all may know the comfort of your abiding presence. Amen. Receive this blessing. God Almighty, God Most Merciful, bless you, keep you, and give you peace. Follow Jesus. <laughs>